go ahead and turn your Bibles to the book of Ezra. And been in the Old Testament in a, in probably a month or two, and so I, I looked around and, and prayed, and, and uh, the Lord led me to this passage tonight. And so we're going to be looking at verses, uh, you know, one through thirteen. And if you're familiar with that, that's the whole chapter. That's all of chapter three of Ezra. So that's what we'll be looking at tonight. Uh, Ezra is part of what is known as the history uh, section of our Old Testaments. It runs from Joshua to Esther. So if you can find any of those books there and wait, make your way to, to Ezra, you'll be doing good. I'm calling tonight's uh, message, Longing for Home. And so what I want us to think about tonight is for those that have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, you know, the Bible makes it clear that, that you have been fully redeemed by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You know that? You know that that's, that's the assurance that we have, that your standing with God is fixed and it's eternally secure, as we talked about last Sunday night, uh, if you were here. Right, that when, you, when God looks at you, uh, He no longer uh, sees your sinfulness. Right? When He looks upon you now, He only sees the righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ, when He sees you. Right? That He does not see you as a sinner to be condemned. He does not see you as His enemy anymore. He sees you as His child to be cherished and loved. That's who you are. That's who you are because of, of what Christ has done for you and your, your decision to follow Him. That the Apostle Paul spoke of God's redemptive love in Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, uh, verses 1 to 7, he wrote this. He says, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Verse 4 is one of those buts that we love. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love which, uh, with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that the, in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And so even though we know in our heart of hearts, we know from the Word of God that, that everything is now settled between us, that everything is now right between us and God, we also know that something's not right with everything else still. That we understand that, that everything's not okay with us uh, uh, in, in the different levels, that everything's not okay in our lives and other areas, and, and that the world that we live in, everything is still not as it should be. Right, that we live in what theologians call the already but not yet. Right, that we we that our salvation is fixed. That we are as saved right now as we ever will be, as far as our standing with God is concerned. And yet, the fullness of our salvation uh, it has not yet come. Right, that it has not yet come yet. We we think of our salvation in, in like three distinct stages. I guess it might be easy to say uh, it that way. That we we are saved. Right, it's a it's a it's a fixed. Uh, reality that's what we call justification that we have placed our faith in Christ we've turned from our sins and we are now justified in his sight but we are also being saved right we're also being saved that's what we call sanctification that's where all of us are right now if you've if you placed your your, your faith in Christ uh, 40 years ago or you pay, placed your faith in Christ this morning we're all in that same process we're all in between we're all in between justification and and glorification and that's our last step right that we will be saved that's the glorification that's where everything is reconciled that's where all of our our our, our flesh will be redeemed and our, our our resurrected bodies will be glorified and all the rights or all the wrongs will be made right once and for all and so if you're a christian it's normal and and it's right for you uh, to no longer feel like you belong here, right? And that's one of the things that we wrestle with. I think even as, as some of our new believers, they're dealing with this transformation. They're dealing with this, uh, you know, they, they don't understand quite how these new feelings that they're experiencing. Like, why do I, I don't feel like I fit in anymore. The things I used to do, the, the people I used to hang out with, the activities I used to enjoy, no longer appeal to me. And, and they're kind of caught up in this. And so I want you to know that it's normal to feel that way. You you should not feel like you belong here anymore. You know why? Because this isn't your home. Right? This isn't your home. This, is, this isn't your eternal home. That, that you should no longer feel 
comfortable here. You should look forward to what is coming. Your home is in heaven with Jesus, that you were just passing through, that the Scriptures often call the people of God pilgrims and sojourners. Why? Because they understand that, that there's a pilgrimage taking place, that you are, our time here is, is, is temporary, and one day we will be heading home. That this world is not your home, heaven is, if you placed your faith in Christ. And Paul would write this in Philippians 3, 20-21. He says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to His glorious body according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. So you might be sitting here wondering why in the world are we going to be looking at Ezra chapter 3 if we're talking about longing for home. And I'm glad that you ask, because I would say that it gives a great example of what it looks like when God's people are longing for home, right? Longing for the fullness of their redemption. If you know anything about Ezra and the timing of this writing, Ezra records the events of the return of the Israelites after 70 years in exile, right? 70 years they were carried away as judgment uh, to the Babylonians uh, uh, in their captivity because of their disobedience that Jerusalem would fall in 586 B.C. to King Nebuchadnezzar, right? As God's judgment, that the walls were torn down in Jerusalem and the gates were burned with fire. But worst of all, especially if you were a Jew at that time, an Israelite, the temple was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. It was stripped of everything of value and it was burned to the ground. You see, this wasn't just the, the Babylonians being the Babylonians, right? If you know anything about your world history that you have these eras in time where you have uh, one nation raised and being the, the, the dominant force on the planet. And uh, at this point, the Babylonians were it, right? The Assyri- you have the Assyrians come along, then the Babylonians, and then you'll move on to, I think, the, uh, the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans. I'm not sure exactly the, the, the progression there, but there's always been you know, someone who's dominating at the time, and the Babylonians uh, were the ones now. And so this wasn't just them doing their thing. This was God using the Babylonians as His instrument of judgment on His disobedient people. That's what the, was happening here at this time. right? That the Israelites had been warned over and over again to repent of their spiritual adultery by prophet after prophet, and, and they just refused to listen. They would not listen uh, that, that God's grace now has come to an end. It has, has ceased and the time for warnings was over and judgment came swiftly and harshly. If you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Right? If you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Is it, there, there comes a point where you are warning. You're, you're saying, don't do that. Right? Don't, don't do that. I've already, and, I, and then maybe you'll, next time you'll say a little more, a little more firmly, look, I already told you once, don't do that. Don't do it again. And then sometimes you get to... Some, some of you don't make it to the third time. Some of you only get one strike. Some, some of you are pretty, pretty harsh. But some of you get to, if you get to strike three, judgment's coming. Right? Mama's going to get the spoon out. Right? The pow pow, whatever it is, and, and bring justice. And so that's what's happening here. Right? That there, there's justice is coming. That, that the, the, the age of, of, of His grace has is, is ended. And, and you know, when what happens is when ba- the Babylonians come in, uh, they set up a siege warfare, which is basically... Uh, you know, they didn't fire a shot. What they would do is they would cut off the, the roads into Jerusalem, block everything up, dam up any waterways that are going in there, and basically they wait them out. People are starving to death. There's no way to get rid of your waste. There's dysentery. People are starving. That, that's what siege warfare does. It just, uh, it just cuts everything off. You think about when uh, one of the tactics that like SWAT teams will use uh, on hostage situations sometimes are bank robberies. And what they do is they, cut, they kill the power. They kill the power, they, they kill the water, they kill all of the utilities to make them miserable, to make them want to give up. That's what siege warfare does, and that's what has happened here. And then once they, uh, the, the uh, Israelites had, had given up, uh, they, they came in and destroyed everything. Jerusalem became a wasteland. And those who didn't die during the siege were carried away to Babylon. And only the weakest and the poorest were left there behind to serve as vine dressers and plowmen. And so some of those that are returning now uh, back to Jerusalem are, 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 are you know, just old men and old women. They're senior citizens. They're elderly at this time. That they had 70 years to think about what their sin had cost them. Can you imagine? 70 years. I think, Mr. Lee, we're just talking about discipleship. How you look back on your life with regret. How often 
that, that you've neglected to study the Word of God and you're making up for it. Now imagine being an uh, uh, Israelite that's been carried away and has lived throughout uh, the, the, the pre-judgment time before they were carried away and understand that God's grace had finally run out and you'd be able to reflect on every year that passes what caused this. Right? This wasn't what God didn't desire this, that you'd brought this on yourself, that 70 years had cost them as individuals and as a nation. And even through Jerusalem, though uh, Jerusalem was nothing but a smoking pile of rubble when they left it, guess what? It was still their home. The land was still theirs. This was still their home, but more importantly, it was God's home. It was where His temple was. And so surely it was the words of Jeremiah the prophet that gave them hope because they knew that God was faithful to keep His promises. They experienced that. That God threatened judgment, and guess what He did? Judgment came. That He, that he had uh, promised those things if they did not repent. And so likewise, when He promised that their exile would only last 70 years, it did. And so and now a new king is in power. That King Cyrus is, is now king, and the king of Babylon. And just as God had stirred Nebuchadnezzar's uh, his heart to conquer Jerusalem, God also stirred the heart of King Cyrus to allow his people to return to Jerusalem. Right? But they were allowed to return in waves. We know this as we read through the Scriptures. So our passage this morning depicts what, uh, this evening depicts what took place after the first wave of return. So if you have your Bibles, and if you're able to stand, it's, uh, it's quite lengthy here. If you're not able to stand, that's okay. But if you can, uh, stand as we honor the reading of God's Word this evening. Ezra uh, chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. It says, And when the seventh month had come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. Then Jeshua, the son of uh, Josadak, and his brethren, the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of uh, Shiltiel, and his brethren arose and built the altar of, of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries, they set the altar on its bases, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening burnt offerings. They also kept the Feast of Tabernacles, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings in the number required by ordinance for each day. Afterwards, they offered the regular burnt offering and those for new moons for, and for all the appointed feasts of the Lord that were consecrated and those of everyone who willingly offered a free will offering to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, although the foundation of the temple of the Lord had not been laid. They also gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food, drink, and all to the people of Sidon and Tyre to bring cedar logs from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa according to the permission which they had from Cyrus king of Persia now in the second month of the second year of the coming to the house of God at Jerusalem Zerubbabel the son of Sheltiel Jeshua the son of Josadak, and the rest of the brethren the priests and the Levites and all those who had come out of the captivity to Jerusalem began work and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and above to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. Then Jeshua with his sons and brothers, uh, Cadmiel with his sons and the sons of Judah, those as one to oversee those working on the house of God, the sons of Hinnadad and their sons and their brethren, the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites and the sons of Asaph with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever towards Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people, for the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard afar off. God, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for the promise of home. And God, as we look at this passage from uh, the Israelites' uh, return after 70 years of captivity, God, let us examine our own lives. And help us to see where, 
maybe the years have passed and, and maybe we look back on our lives with regret and even now uh, we may have uh, uh, in our hearts a, a, a burden of a, a missed opportunity. So let us say, lay those things aside and help us to look forward to the day that you have set for us. That, that, that we have a, a completion of our redemption, that, that, that we have nothing but glory heading our way. Father, to help us to, to long for heaven. Help us to long to be with Christ. Help us to not grow comfortable and, and, and fall in love with this world because it is perishing. God, thank you for this promise. Teach us your word tonight. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So, so here in the nutshell uh, is, a, is the problem for the returning exiles. Basically, they thought that their, their uh, complete redemption was at hand. You know, they, they, they were thinking that they're going to return and everything's going to be right back to the way uh, it, 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 it should be. They were going to come back to the promised land and everything was going to, to be just like it was before. And you see, though God fully forgives His people of their sins when they repent, guess what? Consequences remain. Amen? Y'all understand that. I, I'm not telling you anything new. Hopefully I'm not. I'm not telling you anything that you don't already, already know. That consequences will remain, that nothing will be fully as it should be until Christ returns, right? That nothing will be like that. And so like the returning exile, some Christians believe that just because uh, they've repented of their sins and, and because they've placed their faith in Jesus, that the consequences of their past sins will be taken away, right? Whatever it may be, maybe it's something in your marriage or something like that, or, or maybe some other, other sin, whatever it is, that you're, you're hoping that if I would repent and, and follow Jesus, all of a sudden... All those past things will be fixed. And that's not the case. That's not always the case. That's actually, that's, that's rarely the case for, for any of us, right? That, that, that they, you know, they would believe that their wrongs would be made right, but that's rarely the case whatsoever. You see, repentance and faith in Christ removes our condemnation, right? We understand that. That's what the Bible teaches us, not the consequences that we create because of our sin. That Romans 8, 1 tells us, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. And so as Christians, we too are former exiles, right? When you think about that way, we are former exiles because our sin had separated us from God. That we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus but we are still waiting on the fullness of our redemption, right? Just like the exiles, that, that, that this is not complete yet. See, that's where that that longing in us comes from. That's where that desire in us to be with Jesus. That the Apostle Paul described this longing as, a, as groaning in Romans 8, 22-26. Look what he, what he wrote here. He says that, uh, or 25 rather, says, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but, not, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly, eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So we're talking about here this longing, these, that we groan within ourselves, that, that Paul would identify with us in, the, in, our, in our feelings here. And so this restlessness that you feel in your soul, guess what it is? It's a longing for home. It's a longing for home. You should have this. It's normal for a believer. It's your desire to be with Jesus, to be where Jesus is. So, so what are we to do? If we're not uh, complete now, if we're not uh, uh, where we should be, or, or we are not uh, haven't received the fullness of our redemption, what are we to do while we wait? Well, I'm glad you asked. You see, the third chapter of Ezra gives us a, a glimpse or a snapshot of what our lives as followers of Jesus should look like as we wait for the completion of our redemption in Christ. So the first thing that we do while we wait is we wait in unity. Right? Wait in unity. Just, just looking at verse 1, it says, And when the seventh month had come and the children of Israel were in the cities, the, apostle, the, the people gathered together as one man in Jerusalem. Right, one man. And if you know anything about the history of Israel, uh, very rarely were they united, right? That, uh, that, that they were united or, 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 or separated quite often into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And the, the scriptures 
would tell us that uh, Jesus' own words, uh, a house divided, right, cannot stand. Uh, we can apply that in many different ways. Uh, a, a, a nation that is divided cannot stand. We understand that. Uh, a, a, a husband and a wife, a marriage uh, that is not uh, uh, divided cannot stand. And guess what? Neither can a church. A church that is divided cannot stand either, right? And so this, this unity is essential uh, for God's people, for all of us. We must be united. And so as I've already said, as we look back at the, the Israelites, that, the, that they, were, they were often divided, and, and even before the time of exile, that, that the northern kingdom, or, or they had divided themselves into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, even going so far as to going to war with one another. Can you believe that? That, that God's people, nations, not, not just a, a church fighting amongst one another, that this family and this family and church are disagreeing. We're talking about you know, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people that are at war with one another and both claiming to be God's people. And so they were going to war. But now in verse 1 we read that they have come together as one man in Jerusalem. Right? One man. That their time in exile had reminded them of their true identity as the people of God. You see, it was their refusal to repent that had united them under God's judgment. And now after 70 years, after 70 years of exiles in a foreign land, they were now once again united as, uh, uh, by God's redemption. Right? That, so there were uh, many different denominations. Right? Think about it for us. There's many different denominations just here in Pitkin. You can look around and there's Pentecostals. I and mean, when you've got uh, non-denominational believers, uh, we're Baptists, you've got independent Baptists, all these different denominations. And although uh, the, there are many different denominations and thousands and thousands of individual congregations of believers all over the world, guess what? There is only one church. Y'all know that? One church. There is only one global church that we are united by our common faith in Jesus Christ, that we share in the same grace, that we will share in the same redemption. That Matthew 16, 18 tells us that Jesus Himself is building His church. Right? He is the one that's doing this. And the book of Revelation makes it clear that His church will be made up of every tribe, nation, and tongue. You see, it's His high priestly prayer of John's Gospel that Jesus prayed for the unity of His church. Look with me at John chapter 17, verses 9-11. to He says, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom You have given Me, for they are Yours, and all mine are Yours, and Yours are Mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to You. Holy Father, keep through Your name those whom You have given Me, that they may be one as we are one. That's all about unity. That's what Jesus' prayer is for us, that we would be united. That Jesus would build and grow His church, but it's our responsibility to strive for unity. Right? It's our responsibility ability to, 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 to be united. You see, you can barely go a, a page or two reading in your New Testament without finding a, a, a one another verse, right? The one that says to one another this or one another that over and over again. Just a, a few of them here. I, I've listed a few for us to to see here tonight, love one another. That's John 13, 34 to 35. Be devoted to one another. Honor one another. That comes from Romans 12, 10. Live in harmony with one another. That's Romans 12, 16. Stop passing judgment on one another. Romans 14, 13. Accept one another. Romans 15, 7. Agree with one another. 1 Corinthians 1, 10. Encourage one another. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Serve one another. Galatians 5.13 Be kind and compassionate to one another. Ephesians 4.32 Submit to one another. Ephesians 5.21 Forgive one another. Colossians 3.13 Teach and admonish one another. Colossians 3.16 Don't grumble and against one another. Y'all, James 5.9 Write that one down. Just, I'm going fast. Write that one down. Commit that one to memory. Don't grumble against one another. And then offer hospitality to, hospitality to one another. That's 1 Peter 4 9. And I'm going to put this one on the screen because this one uh, really stands out, I think, as far as the, the, us as a church really speaks a lot to who, what He's calling us to do. Hebrews 10 uh, 24 to 25. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. 
You see, we need to be unified. We need each other. We need to be on the same page. You see, Satan and his demons will do everything within their, their power to divide us as a church. Y'all know that? He wants to see us divided. He wants to see disunity. And we dare not let that happen. That we must remain unified as we wait for the completion of our redemption in Christ. Number two, we must wait in obedience. Wait in obedience. And just looking at verses 2 and 3 here, look at it once again with me. It says, Then Jeshua, the son of uh, Josadak, and his brethren the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, ar- arose and built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries, they, they set the altar on its bases, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening burnt offerings. So it's interesting to me that, that one of the first things that we see the returning exiles do is they rebuild the altar, right? They rebuild the altar so they can make sacrifices to the Lord, right? Again, I keep thinking about that. those years, those years that have passed, 70 years in exile is a lot of time to think about what went wrong. And the most egregious part of their sin was that they had turned to worshiping the false gods of the pagans, right? That's, that's the number one uh, indictment against them. And even when they did worship the true God, guess what they did? They didn't worship Him the way that He commanded them to, that they would bring blemished offerings before God, and they would not give God His best. And so when we think about this, not worshiping God rightly, it, it, it makes me think about this. It's possible to do the right thing, but be doing it the wrong way. Let me say that again, because I think this is where some of us are at right now. It's possible to do the right thing, but be doing it the wrong way. You see, the fear of God was on them all, right? That they were, that were dwelling in His holiness, and they were uh, contemplating what uh, God required of them again. They were careful to offer the sacrifices according to how the law of Moses commanded them. See, that's where they got off track before, right? They began to take shortcuts and do this and do that, and they, and they lost sight of of what God had commanded them to do. And so the reminders of God's judgment remained everywhere they looked. If you can imagine, as as they're trying to set the altar up, and they're trying to to, to gather the materials for this, as they're doing this, you know what's around them? Rubble. Right? Just imagine that. It's still still burnt stone, and there's lots of, you know, just devastation everywhere. And so they can see it. The reminders of their disobedience are everywhere in uh, in their lives. It would take decades to rebuild all that, their disobedience had destroyed. And they did not want to make the same mistakes again. So let me just add a few things here is to, to deal with the context of what we're talking about. You see, not everyone was happy that they were back. Can you all imagine? Can you imagine that all of a sudden there's this, this big open territory where the, the Israelites have been removed, and so you know that, that land's not going to stay vacant. This would be a land grab, what you're going to have. And you have all these people of the land are going to come in and try to occupy and take possession. So not everybody was happy uh, that they were back. That they were surrounded by enemies is what this text tells us. That they were lots of opposition for them being back. And so when the Israelites left their new reclaimed homesteads, right, that they, had returned and they would come into Jerusalem to, to worship, they put themselves in the lands of their ancestors at great risk. And so for 70 years, as, as an exile had taught them the value of being obedient to God. They had learned. They had learned a hard and and costly lesson. Uh, James M. Hamilton Jr. said like this. He says, Better to obey God and worship Him than to do what you think is safe. Better to obey God and worship Him than to do what makes sense in the eyes of the world. Right? And that applies in so many areas of our own lives. And, you know, what what may make sense to you doesn't matter. What may make sense to the world doesn't matter. What matters is, what does the Word of God say? Right? You know, it don't, have to, it don't have to be logical to you. It don't have to make sense to you. But you have to, this is what the Word of God says. This is what we do. This is what we believe. And that's what we see here in this text. As New Testament believers, we're, we're, we too are faced with opportunities for disobedience on a daily basis. Right? That the evidence that, that, that someone has truly been born again is that they have a growing desire for holiness and righteousness. Right? We talked about this also in discipleship. It's growth. Right, that you're you're not automatically made perfect, that you're not uh, 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 automatically as holy as you would like to be. It's a progress. It's a progression. It's a, it's a growth 
that we should see in our lives. That a true Christian will grow to hate uh, when they sin. Right? Whatever God hates, you learn to hate. Whenever you find yourself falling into sin, it should break your heart. It should trouble you. Listen to me. If you can sin and, and not have it trouble you, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Either, either your, your, your heart is growing hard towards God or you're not saved at all. That, that's, that's your two realities. It's something's, something's amiss there. But if you can sin openly and repeatedly and you feel no conviction of the Spirit, you're in trouble. I, I have great concern for you. So evidence for a believer is that, that you'll begin to hate uh, unrighteousness and, and, and whenever you sin, you'll have the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your life. And, and, and so we should, you know, you know, we should f- not fear God per se of His judgment because we won't be judged. That Christ was judged for our sin already, but you know what? We should fear His chastisement, right? We should fear His chastisement, but, but we should also welcome it. That God disciplines His children when they are disobedient. And so let us never forget the torment of hell that we were rescued from because of our disobedience to God. Or more importantly, let us never forget the terrible price that Jesus paid to purchase our redemption. You see, we must remain obedient to God and His Word as we wait for the completion of our redemption in Christ. And thirdly, and lastly, we wait and worship. Right? We wait and worship. We worship while we wait. You can however you want to word that. <clears throat> verses 10 and 11. Just looking at those couple of verses. It says, When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the the sons of Asaph with symbols to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for He is good and for His mercy endures forever towards Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundations of the house of the Lord was laid. And so they began, as we already discussed, uh, with the, with the uh, altar, and so they could begin worshiping God through making the sacrifices and, and offering as prescribed by the law of Moses. And so as time has moved on now, as, as progressed, uh, we're not sure exactly how long, uh, the, the people grew to be more and more zealous for worship once again. They had a taste of it, right? They reminded what it was like to be able to worship God freely, and, and, and they had a, created a, in them a, 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 ze- a zealousness once again. That everyone uh, uh, did their part, as we read in this passage. Everyone did their part. The, the specialized craftsmen did their thing. The masons and the stoneworkers did their part. And the carpenters and the blacksmiths, they all got busy working on the foundation. And they were having uh, logs and, and cedars you know, brought in from other countries. And all these things were taking place. And we also know that even the Levites were once again given oversight over the work of the house of God. You see, even their labor was an act of worship to their God. That's how they began to see it. That their labor, they enjoyed what they were doing. That everything that we do, we should also see it as an opportunity for bringing honor and glory to God. Right? In the same way for us, everything that you do, your job, or if you're a student at school, or if you're retired, whatever it is you do, it's an opportunity for worship. That Paul addressed this in Colossians 3, uh, 22 and 23. He says, Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Right? Whatever you do. Whatever. Again, what does whatever mean? It means whatever. Everything that we do. It does, there is no, no stipulation there. And so with every stone uh, that was placed in the foundation, they were one step closer to not only completing the temple, but also reclaiming their identity as God's people, right? That the foundation was being laid, and they were so excited about this process. That verse 11 tells us that they sang songs of praise and thanksgiving, that they shouted with a great shout, right? You see, what what could cause them to respond with such passion and excitement, right? I ask myself the same question as we gather weekly and in the morning time and in the evening times and when we sing these songs whenever the praise team comes up and when Ryan and, and Josh and Caleb and Stacy and, and, and whoever's up here leading us in music, how can we sometimes sit here as though we're totally uninterested? Right? Totally uninterested or sit here and not sing at all. Right? What is wrong with us? Do we not realize what we're here for? Right? They, they, they got it. These people... God, after returning from exile, they understood 
what they were doing there. They were excited to worship God. They once again had experienced the mercy and the goodness of God. That 70 years of exile was an act of grace. That God would have been just in destroying them all because of their idolatry and their refusal to repent. Right? He would have been just in that. He didn't have to send them into exile. He, that was, the exile was grace. And yet here they are now, freely worshiping their God once again. And so we too, once we grasp the reality of God's grace in our lives, we will see everything in life as an opportunity to worship God. Right? Everything is an opportunity. In modern times, we have learned to compartmentalize our lives, haven't we? We compartmentalize everything that we do. We tend to have our our, our work life here. We have our family life here. We have our hobbies over here. And then if you're a Christian, guess what? You have another compartment for your church life. This is, this is what I do as a Christian. But you see, that's not what we're called to do. We're not called to separate ourselves like this. right? That, that, that we, we, you know, we're not called to separate those things. That even on Sundays at church, guess what we do? We compartmentalize things here also. We may not think of it that way, but we do. You know, we, we, we tend to think that we, can, uh, we, we study the Word of God in Sunday school and in discipleship training. That's one compartment. Then we hear the Word of God in the preaching time. That's another compartment. And then we sing. And you know what we call our singing? We call it worship. Wrong. Right? So singing is not, that's not the worship portion of the service. Everything that we do here is worship. It's supposed to be. You see, if you think that, you know, that, that just when you sing is worship, what are you doing the rest of the time? Right? We, we are created for worship. And let me tell you something about music. Music, some people say they call the person that leads me a worship leader. There's no such thing as a worship leader, right? And so you can either, when music is played, you can either worship or you cannot worship, right? Worship has nothing to do with, or music has nothing to do with worship. Either you can worship with the music or you cannot. That's just the way it is. And it's the same way with the, with the, with the preaching of God's Word uh, in Sunday school, whatever it is. You see, that if we only worship God when we sing, we're in trouble. And some of y'all are in real trouble because you never sing. Right? And so thank God that that's not the case. Everything that we do here or, or, or anywhere else should be done with an attitude of worship. The Charles Spurgeon rightly believed that. He said this, he said, All places are places of worship to a Christian. All places are places of worship to a Christian. That's one of the things that I'm thankful that we have this building. I'm thankful for Occupy 2 Baptist Church that we can gather here in the comfort of air conditioning in the summer and in the, the, the warmth of, of, of the heating unit in the wintertime, right? But we don't, you don't have to be here to worship. We can indeed worship anywhere, and we should worship anywhere, but we are called as the people of God to, to, to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We just saw that verse. And so we are thankful for this, but all places are to be places of worship for us. So what does that look like, Brother Mike? Again, I'm glad y'all asked. Y'all have some really good questions today. This morning y'all asked some good ones. you got some more good ones tonight. You give. It means this. You give whatever you are doing your best effort. That's what it means. Your very best effort. Just as if you were doing it to the Lord. As if you were offering it to the Lord. When you read your Bible, right? When you read your Bible, give it your best efforts. When In your prayers and in your service to the church, in your singing, in your yard work, your, your laundry folding, your car washing. If you're, if you're still working, you're the hardest worker at your place of employment. If you're a student, guess what? You're the hardest working and most faithful student in your class. That's what it means. That's what it means. That's what it looks like to, to worship God everywhere in every way. That God has given us His best by giving us His one and only Son. And He deserves to get our very best in return. Amen? That's, that's the absolute truth. It is our reasonable service, right? Romans 12, 1, that we learned about tonight. It's our reasonable service that we must remain worshipful of our God as we wait for the completion of our redemption in Christ. So as we close tonight, I want you to think about a few things. You see, for a Christian, uh, you know, to, to long for home is to long for redemption. That's what it's all about. And I, and I, and I know we have lots of reasons and and even this afternoon, we, we, you know, we got a, a phone call to go and, uh, and to be with Benita and, and, and Patricia and, and their mother passed away. And I, and I was thinking about this message, you know, that sometimes we, we think of heaven. And, and a lot of us in this room, we think we, we have loved ones that have passed and we long to see them. We long to, 
to be reunited with them. But see, ultimately, you know what? For a believer, you know what? Our, our, our death or His return, what it means? We're, we're, we're joined with Christ. That's what we're excited about. We're longing for home. That the, the long for home is to long for redemption. And to long for redemption is to long for Christ Himself. That we desire to go to heaven because Christ is there. Right? Because Christ is there. That's why we want to, want to, want to be there. That He chose to leave His home in heaven to come down and redeem the world. But you see, it's not automatic. And some people want to make it like, you know, that, that God loves everyone, and He does. But you see, He doesn't save everyone. Only those who turn to Him in faith are the ones that are saved. We don't believe the Bible teaches universalism. It doesn't matter if you led a good life. It doesn't matter if you're, you, know, you did more good deeds than bad things in your life. That if you did but one bad deed, one sin is enough to condemn you to an eternal hell is what the Bible would teach us. And so we, we, we must turn to Him. We must repent of our sins and place our faith in Him. And, 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 and then, and only then, will we, will we get to experience this redemption. This means that one day we will be reunited with Him in the heavenly home that He has prepared for us. And so let Jesus' encouraging words to the disciples before His arrest and crucifixion be an encouragement to us tonight as we get ready to depart. Because it also applies to us. And you often hear this at funerals. John 14, verses 1 to 3 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He's talking about going home. He's talking about the the fullness of our redemption. So let us not grow weary, church, as we wait. Let us wait in unity. Let us wait in obedience. And let us wait in worship. Amen? All right. Let me pray for us, and we'll have a time of response. Father, we thank you so much for this day. God, thank you for the reality of heaven. Thank you for the promise of redemption. If if we did not have the hope of heaven, if this was all there was, what a sad and miserable life it would be. But God, you sent your one and only Son to to make a way for us, to, to die for our sins, to make a way for us to be reconciled back to you, that you made redemption possible. And so God, for those who place their faith in Christ, this is not it. And even if if we're blessed to have a great life and, and we, a, a wonderful life here and, and, and surrounded by friends and families and we have great circumstances and, and maybe even great wealth and we never experience the hardships of, of, of health struggles or financially or whatever it is, that, that this life is as close to hell as we will ever experience if we were in Christ Jesus. So Father, create in us a longing where some of us have grown complacent, where some of us have began to love this world a little too much, God, would you give us a distaste for it? Would you, would you place a burden on our hearts that we would once again fix our eyes on Christ, that we would long for Him like nothing else? Make Him ultimate in our hearts, in our affections. God, we thank You for all that You've done this day, God, and we ask that You just continue to do a work in our lives. Help us to be effective. Help us to be a useful uh, tool to you in this community to reach it with the gospel so that our neighbors and our, and, and our, and our uh, co-workers and, and our fellow students would also have the same hope, the same longing that we ha- have in us because of the promise of redemption through faith in Christ. We love you, Lord. Help us to live in a way that's worthy of your love. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.